So there in the central verse of the central chapter of the central of the three books in the last section of Isaiah, you have the central truth of Christianity. That though you and I are guilty people, wounded people, people without complete peace, God loved us enough to pay the price of our sins, to bear our sins, to take our iniquities, that we might be innocent, that we might have peace. And remember that's the Hebrew word shalom. It doesn't mean just what we mean by peace. When the Jews greet one another with shalom, they mean health, happiness, contentment, fulfilment, satisfaction. They mean everything that's involved in joy, health and happiness. Upon him was the chastisement that procured our peace. So, these are a few things that you must keep in mind. Before we look, before we look at these wonderful verses about our Lord Jesus as foretold centuries before his birth, before we look at them, I want you to look at their setting. Would you come back with me, please, to what is known as the Second Servant Song. We're going to look at chapter 49. I think we've talked before <coughs> about how the book of Isaiah has four songs known as servant songs. Now, originally, Israel was meant to be the servant of God. Israel, if faithful, would have spread and conquered the whole world and informed all the world about God and his truth. That was God's plan. But human nature never fulfills God's plan because we are sinful and we forget that we need God in everything. So these servant songs that were originally meant to encourage Israel to occupy the world and spread the truth of God, ultimately they change and they come down to apply to one man who himself would do all that the nation failed to do. In other words, Jesus. And we're going to look now at the second of those songs in chapter 49. Would you turn there, please? Notice in verse 1 it says, Listen to me, you islands, hear this, you distant nations. That's very important. Because over and over in this book of Isaiah, the promises of Genesis, that a Jew would bless the whole world, those promises are referred to constantly in this book. And here in the first verse of this servant song, listen to me, you islands, hear this, you distant nation. See, Jews didn't live in islands. They hated the sea. They stayed in their tiny little land, which is only about 150 miles broad by 50 miles the other way. They hated the sea. So when this addresses islands and distant lands, it means the non-Jews. Before I was born, the Lord calls, called me. From my birth, he's made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow, concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I'll display my splendor. Christ is here called Israel, as he, as he is sometimes called David. You'll notice further on that says that in verse 5, that he would bring Jacob back and gather Israel. So the reference in verse 3 to Israel is to Christ. But now verse 4. Here is the first hint of what is to be expanded in the great messianic passage of Isaiah 52, 53 of the sufferings of Christ. Here's the first hint of it in Isaiah. Verse 4 of chapter 49. <coughs> but I said I've laboured to no purpose, I spent my strength in vain and for nothing, yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand. My reward is with my God. Then in verse 7, this is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation. Isn't it amazing that the one man who would fulfill what the Jewish nation was meant to be would be hated by the nation? Isn't it a mystery today that the only Jew who's ever kept the law of Israel perfectly is hated by Israel? Isn't that mysterious? 
To him who is despised and abhorred by the nation, to a servant of rulers, kings will see you and rise up. Princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Now come please to what's known as the third servant song in chapter 50 and beginning at verse 4. Christ is speaking again. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I've not been rebellious. I've not drawn back. Now please notice, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. There's nothing more insulting to Orientals than having the hairs of the body plucked. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. So in these second and third servant songs, you have the first intimation that's going to be spelled out in, in two chapters soon coming up, 52 and 53. But before we get there, I want you to come to chapter 51. This is not a servant song. This has a series of admonitions. The word listen is repeated over and over and look and hearken and lift up your eyes. In chapter 51, there's a series of wonderful promises that this nation which was in captivity, that was hated by the Babylonians and that seemed to have no hope, God makes a, a series of great promises. Verse Three, the Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He'll make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Look at verse 5. My righteousness draws near speedily. My salvation's on the way. My arm will bring justice to the nations, meaning the Gentiles. The islands, again the Gentiles, will look to me. Then at the end, please, of verse 6, my salvation will last forever and my righteousness will never fail. And so here you have a series of promises. You have it again at the end of verse 8. My righteousness will last forever. My salvation through all generations.